Buckley, and today we head off to, well, this is one of those ethereal stories. You have to kind of put yourself in a, a mood to go back in time and try and experience or relive something that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, what, what we're going to do, Mike, is take a look at the River of Destiny. That's the Skeena, named by Wiggs O'Neill. And we're going to go right from Hazleton right down to Port Essington, and actually a little bit beyond. We'll go to Port Simpson as well. And we're going to take a look at some of the some of the marvelous Indian villages that surrounded that uh, that river, Kitsilis and Kitsigukla and Kitwankul and Kitwangaw and so on. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the fascinating parts of British Columbia history. We'll take a look at individuals very briefly, like, uh, like Catiline. And here's a, here's a photograph of Catiline's pack train in at Fort Simpson. That is a and, huge uh, pack train. That's right. Where is he packing to? What's oh, he's, he's packing to the gold fields. Gold, um, you know, gold Creeks like Manson Creek and so on in the northern part of that country. And so. there is Manson Creek right there. Yeah. That's where he's heading to. Yeah. And uh, how, when was that starting? What years are we talking about here? Well, we're probably looking at uh, late 1890s in that particular photograph. Well, that photograph was taken after that. So yeah. Manson Creek was one of, the, one of the coarse gold creeks in, the, in that general area. Now, I remember this uh, photo, I think, from a show a long time ago. Sure. The stern wheelers of the Skeena yeah. were, I mean, the stories about them are absolutely heroic. Oh, yeah. They, 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 it was really quite a magnificent river and some very, very great hazards in the river. That's the Amanika running down through Devil's Elbow, right near Lauren Creek. And they had to line that part of it to get around that elbow, with almost a vertical turn. Okay, and once again, the point of this is, is that this was a bustling area. There, oh, this yeah. was a route to the gold fields. Sure. All sorts of industry and uh, co commerce yeah. established, all gone. Well, Mike, the Stern Wheelers ran from about 1890 right to about 1912, when the Grand Trunk Pacific really finished its line. And they had three major wrecks. There were 16 stern wheelers that ran on the river and some magnificent captains who thought the river was theirs. Coast along the Skeena today on Gold Trail. Town's Mike Roberts and Bill Barley taking a journey onto the Skeena River for some ghost stories, so to speak. You give a lot of credit to the guy who wrote these books for these stories. This is Wiggs O'Neill. Yeah, I would have loved to have met him. He, was, he had a kind of a checkered childhood. He was brought up in the Bonaparte country and then later in the Queen Charlottes and finally into that in the country that he called home, and that was the Skeena River. And I don't think anybody knew it better, Mike, than Wiggs O'Neill. I've, I've corresponded with some of his relatives. He's been long gone. But if you get a book by Wiggs O'Neill, you should buy it. So, he's funny, uh, he's accurate, he's got a great memory. Whitewater Men of the Skeena, Along the Totem Trail, Steamboat Days on the oh, Skeena yeah. River. Yeah, he's great. This is a guy after your own heart, oh, I have a feeling, course. or maybe you're a guy after his own heart. Yeah, We're going to do this through photographs. Who do we owe these photographs to? This was a very busy, highly commercialized yeah. area. All of these, all of these are from the provincial archives in British Columbia. And they're available to people, and they're on the public record. So we have some great photographs of the Skeena River. There's no doubt about it at all, Mike. And one of these is a town that's virtually gone. This is, this is Eby's Landing, and there was a hotel there and a general store and everything else, and it's vanished because that was prior to the Grand Trunk Pacific. So the Stern Wheelers owned the Skeena Valley until the Grand Trunk Pacific came in and took that business away from them. Now, some of the people that are on here, we're also talking about characters. Oh, yeah. Now, this next shot is a really a character shot. Sure. Uh, nothing, I don't know, I'm, I'm hooked on boats. Nothing more exciting than to see uh -huh. a couple of stern wheelers moored on a river. Tell me what's the deal. Yeah, that must this. have been grand, because really what this is, these are two stern wheelers tied up at, at E.B. Landing again, also known, known as Kitsum Gallum, by the way. And Captain Bonzer was one of the, one of the great uh, captains there. And they had Indian pilots on the river, Mike. One of them was Captain Walter Wright, who was a pretty big man. And they got into the little canyon, which was pretty tough water, and he'd never taken over the stern wheeler. So we have Captain Bonzer there, and we have Captain Wright there. And Bonzer says, at least Wright says to Bonzer, Captain, can I take over? So Bonzer said, well, okay, you take over. And in those days, the stern wheelers were operated not by steam, some of them. At least the wheel wasn't. So you had to take that wheel, and you had to wrestle the wheel. Well, it got caught in a, in a, side, in a side current, and the, and the wheel grabbed, grabbed Walter Wright under the vest and threw him right over top of the wheel, right, in, right into the wall of the pilot house, broke the planks. <laughs> so he got up about 30 seconds later and says, oh, all right, Captain, him okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mean just the power of that river oh, yeah. through this guy? It took him right up over the wheel, bang, drove him in just like a bullet into the, into the pilot house wall. He broke the planks and jumped up and threw him, oh, Captain, him okay. <laughs> <laughs> He well, wasn't okay, by the way. A tough, a tough job to do, these guys. Well, how did anybody else do it? They just didn't grip the wheel quite as tight no, no, and let they, it spin? They gripped it very, very tightly indeed. And welded themselves to the floor. And didn't wear a vest. 
as you mentioned, yeah. the uh, Indian people of this yeah. uh, area and are important. And yeah. look at the mask, look at the headdress on this man. Yeah, it's, it's really quite remarkable. And that's, that's what's called a front lip, actually, Mike. And he's there with his grandson, I'm quite sure, and wearing the, wearing the button, button coat of, uh, of the Skeena River Indians. And it's really quite a remarkable photograph. And this is a chief's house? Yeah, who he called himself chief of, uh, chief of Canada, or Canada chief, and, uh, but generally chief of Canada. And those are probably house poles in front, which would be clan poles and house poles. So there's a difference. And uh, really quite, quite a nice, uh, and that was a Kitwan Cool which is a very interesting village, by the way, even and today. Does it still exist? So is, some yeah. of these places have not disappeared. Well, no, I went into Kitwan Cool with uh, Cyril Murray, an old, old friend of mine, in 1971, if I remember correctly, and we noticed that when we smiled at the Indian children at four years old, they didn't smile back at all. They didn't acknowledge us, which was quite interesting. And that was 25 years ago, Mike. Do you have any uh, inkling as to why? Uh, yeah, they were they were lords of the river, the Kitwan Cool Indians, and they, they owned the Grease Trail, and uh, which is the Ulicum route, so... Uh, they had some uh, grievances, I think, yeah. Yeah. This is a beautiful shot of yeah. a, uh, a war canoe, a dugout canoe. Yeah, on the ski. Uh, well, probably at Kitwan Cool River, that one particular one, yeah. L and when this, I mean, t obviously this is taken in the 1800s. No, that will be taken probably a little bit later. I think yeah. that was taken about nine, turn of the century, probably 1910. Nothing on the back of the photograph to identify that. Yeah. But look at the work on oh, that. Oh, beautiful just, work. Just sure. gorgeous, indeed. That's an ocean-going canoe. Now, this is a mortuary pole as well. Yeah, it is. And this may be one of the reasons the uh, children mm -hmm. didn't smile at you. Well, probably. Now, that the, the, the individual on the bottom of that pole, which is a little indistinct, is a guy called Kitwan Cool Jim. He was under arrest by a provincial police officer in 1884. He resisted arrest and was shot dead. So they... Uh, they carved him right into the pole. They did. They carved him right into the pole. That's a mortuary pole. And you'll find that in a lot of the mortuary poles. So he was still there in the 1920s, you know, 40 years after. I, I don't know, but I've never seen a representation of a, of a mortal incorporated into the pole this way before. Yeah, so well, you, you, you will see. Yes, it is quite common, actually. Okay, isn't that interesting? Yeah. More, uh, it's uh, Kit One Cool Jim. Kit One Cool Jim. Okay. Yeah. This photograph, again, shows it must have been something to oh, be on the North yeah. Coast and see the totem poles yeah. just there as a cultural thing every day. I'll never forget it even 25 years ago. This is Kitwan Cool and the last of the totem poles there. But when I was up in Kitwan Ga, I woke up one morning and the totem poles were just waving back and forth in the breeze, Mike. It was amazing, hole in the sky and all the other totem poles. And I said, well, I'll never see it again and I will never see it again. That is a memorable moment. Yeah. Now, we get back to the river again. Yeah. The little canyon is uh, filled with great stories. Oh, yeah. Now, this is, uh, now you know, that looks sort of kind of like the Minto. I mean, all stern wheelers followed, I guess, a basically similar design, yeah. shallow draft, stern uh, wheel. Yeah, they did. And they, they didn't want to draw much water. And the captains were interesting. There's Captain Myers, for instance, the terrible Swede. And he was impatient, a very, very good captain. Is that his name, sort of, uh, when you <laughs> were in, in town, you called him that? Or he yeah, was they called him the terrible Swede. He, he, took, he, uh, he, he accepted that. He liked us. <laughs> they all had nicknames, you know. Yeah. I mean, Captain Shannon was the wild Irishman, and he wasn't wild at all. But Captain Myers, uh, he, went, he tied up the Little Canyon once. And the Little Canyon in high water was very tough to handle. And he waited there for two days, and he said, finally, Ah, to hell with it, boys. V hit it. He was actually German, not a Swede, okay? <laughs> v hit it. And he drove, and he full speed, full speed ahead with it, with the stern wheeler, full power ahead. And they got into that turbulent water, and that stern wheeler bow went under, and, and it turned around, and the bow went under again, and, the, and he darn near lost the boat. And he finally managed to back back up out of the canyon and get out of it. And they said it was just pale like parchment. I mean, it was, it was really in bad trouble. So, um, he, so he, was, he was a fascinating he survived. guy. I guess surviving any of these, uh, any of these uh, stories was half the battle. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, you know, he, was, he was so good, though. He could judge distances absolutely spectacularly. Once he was coming down Ringbolt Island, which is in the big canyon, that's Kitzelis Canyon. And uh, there was a Hudson's Bay official on board, and a very high-ranking Hudson's Bay official. And he got in a real tight spot, and he drove in close to the island. And when the Hudson's Bay official, he was just gripping the rail like this, and finally they made it through the island, and he said, he said, Captain Myers, Captain Myers, you only missed Ringbolt Island by a foot. And Captain Myers said, a foot? He said, I thought it was only four inches. He was a cool customer. <laughs> he was really a cool customer. Uh, lots of jam, but yeah. he did frighten himself occasionally. Oh, yeah, sure he did. Okay, this photograph. Look at this now. This is a little... At first, you don't know what you're looking at, and then suddenly yeah. you see these guys suspended in the sky. Sure. 
Yeah, well, this where is, the, is this and what is this about? Well, this is, this is in a little place called Kitsilis, which actually had several hundred people, about 20 businesses. It's really quite remarkable. And it vanished eventually. It's gone now. You can't even find very, very few traces of Kitsilis above the canyon. These people were going around the canyon so they wouldn't have to take a stern when they're through the canyon. Well, but mind you, if they, threw, if they fell that 30 feet, Mike, uh, they were in very, <laughs> very deep trouble indeed. So uh, that's Kitsilis, Kitsilis itself, Kitsilis Town. And it was at the head of the canyon. Now this shot is looks like a town deserted, but uh, who are those people? Are they museum goers, or what's the deal here? Well, it reminds me of my childhood. I saw a lot of towns like this. It's about 1932, and the the big hotel in Kitsilis, and uh, you know about a dozen stores or 15 stores down there, and they're going on to see what's left. And there's nothing left, of course, because the railway killed Kitsilis, and it was right in the big canyon, of course, and it was very important in its day. And when you talk about the big canyon, you talk about you know, you have to go back to the stern wheelers, and, and certainly Wiggs, Wiggs O'Neill tells kind of a funny story there. And he was, he was up on one of the stern wheelers in the big canyon, and they had a guy called Eddie Crickney with him, and Eddie, Eddie Crickney was the purser, and there was a whole crew on board, and they couldn't get through the big canyon. The water was just too tough. It was high water. They stayed there, eventually stayed there just over two weeks, Mike, and they decided they would have a contest, and they each threw some money in a kitty, and whoever caught the biggest Dolly Varden would get all the money. Well, the contest was on. They, they were literally fished 24 hours a day, these guys. And in the first few days, Eddie Crickney, who was the purser of the ship, I think it was the Hazelman, I'm not sure, uh, he caught a huge, huge Dolly Varden. And everybody tried to beat him. Well, nobody came close. And the last day came around, and the captain of the ship finally caught one that came about two-thirds that size. So the crew got together and said, you know, Crickney has really been bragging a lot. Maybe we better turn this contest around. So they cut the salmon open, and they threw in a lot of stones in the gut of the salmon, and then sewed it up again. And then they weighed the two, and much to Crickney's absolute amazement, the little salmon weighed a lot more than this big salmon. He was very annoyed about it indeed, and he, sm he smelled a rat, of course. And finally they confessed, okay, Crickney, you won it. But he wasn't very happy at first. Well, I mean, you did what you could during oh, two sure. weeks of high water. Oh, yeah, sure. And there were, there were a lot of practical jokers in the river because there was a lot of time to spend. I guess so. And Wiggs is one of the worst things. And heck, if you were one of the uh, survivors on any one of the events on these <laughs> yeah, boats, you, yeah. you, you, each day was precious. Oh, of course. As you point out, I mean, this area was for commerce, going yeah. gangbusters. Yeah. And one of the things that was uh, paving the way were fisheries and yes. the canneries. Yeah. Where is this cannery? Well, that's, that's Diamond C. Cunningham's cannery. That we, we mentioned Diamond C. before, and a couple of things we didn't mention. He was an Irishman, and he owned, he owned virtually all of Point Essington, which he founded on an old Indian village called Spokeshoot. And, uh, you know, funny, the, the, the Skeena River did not treat him well. His son died in the Skeena, drowned, and so did his wife. So it was interesting. But he stayed there most of his days, died very suddenly, actually about 1905. But he founded the Skeena River Cannery, and he was joined by other canneries, and the other cannery is uh, the British America Cannery. And there were hundreds and hundreds of workers in, the, in, in that particular town. This town had three hotels, had a round, and you have to be very, very careful, well over a thousand people, probably between a thousand and fifteen hundred people at its height, Mike. And look at, I mean, there it is. The boardwalk is there. I sure. mean, look at the hotels. Oh yeah. And as a matter of fact, That's Dufferin Street. Today we were talking to uh, the museum in uh, Prince Rupert and yeah. talking to them about what was at Port Essington now. Well, virtually nothing. I flew over Port Essington about three years ago, Mike. And all you can see, and it's really a ghostly scene. We talk about Ghosts of the Skeena, and that's why we named this program Ghosts of the Skeena, because all you see in Port Essington is the old boardwalks and some of the old houses left. There were hundreds of houses and buildings in Port Essington. It's virtually vanished. What, reclaimed by the, uh, by the rainforest well, or no. stripped by uh, salvagers? Prince, Prince Rupert took over from Port Essington. It was a more logical site. So Prince Rupert is, is flourishing. Port Essington is vanished. All right. Here we've got uh, a band, and this is uh, at a salmon cannery, and this looks like a, an Indian band. That's the famous uh, Indian brass band, and that's 1897, and they're pretty proud of themselves. They have the uniforms, and Indians are kind of fond of uniforms, as whites are. And uh, this, they played at every, every festival, every occasion in Port Essington, and they were really quite remarkable and very skilled, by the way. Look, as you were pointing out, grand houses, <laughs> oh, I yeah. mean, big establishments. Yeah. yeah, these are two of the three hotels in Port Essington. And that's at its height, Brown's General Store, the whole bunch of general stores, hotels, you name it, and the population. And it was, it was a very tough town on, on Saturday nights. The pr provincial police constables had a pretty tough, uh, pretty tough time, Mike. Who is this guy? And this, <laughs> is a, this is a restaurant yeah. 
Joe's restaurant? Yeah, he called China Joe, and China Joe was an interesting guy. He had a little restaurant in there and decided to set it up on, uh, in, in Port Essington and set it up on the, on, on the Skeena. And he charged 25 cents for all the beef, steak, and eggs you could eat. He must yeah. have had a gold mine because this, was, this was fish country. I would have automatically yeah. assumed it would be a fish restaurant. No, it was not. No, people liked his meals, and he stayed there till his dying day. Sometimes I always think that uh, running this, uh, the rapids and the canyons is tough coming upstream, but it must have been just as evil going downstream. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was very tough. You had to be very careful and make sure the water wasn't too high. And that, that's a good shot of really of the inlander running the big canyon at Kitsilis. And, you know, it, it was kind of a storied area. And uh, Wiggs O'Neill tells one story about when he and, and a guy called Kerrigan, who was the MLA for Atlin, went up the river, along with a guy called Harstone. And Harstone was really a mining promoter. But what had happened is that, is that a man called Mr. Phelan had written a letter to the two Frenchmen who were up in a place called Hole in the Wall. And that their job was to keep that telegraph line in shape. And they hadn't done a very good job. So anyway, they, they landed just below Hole in the Wall. And Kerrigan and O'Neill headed up towards the two Frenchmen while Harston, he looked around to see where this mineral deposit was and so on. And they, they got up to the Frenchman, the, log, the tall Frenchman there called View. And View was a gourmet cook, by the way, and they knew this. So they showed them the letter. They said, no, 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 you know, Mr. 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 Phelan is coming up right now. He's just down here, and he'll be down there for a couple hours. But he's coming up here, and he's going to look at that line. And they knew they hadn't done a good job. So, so View and his partner rigged up the best meal you would ever have on the Skeena. They had ditched, actually, they'd got some uh, Hudson's Bay uh, Scotch whiskey from an old wreck. And they had, they had ferreted that away, and they brought it out, and they put out a gourmet meal. And when Harston, when Harston came in, who was acting as Phelan, they thought it was Phelan, of course, and they sat him down, and they had a lot of, lot of, lot of food and a lot of liquor. And, and, of course, the liquor kept on flowing, and everyone got pretty happy, including Harston. And finally, he said, well, what about my... Uh, he forgot who he was supposed to play. He forgot he was supposed to be Phelan. He said, well, what about my mineral claims? And View caught on quickly, and he jumped, and he says, you, O'Neill, you, Kerrigan, you great big damn liars. <laughs> <laughs> but they got the meal out of oh, it. Oh, yeah, sure they did. Did they do any improvement on the uh, telegraph no, line? No, 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 it was just the same. Did Phelan thing. ever show up? And no, then, never no, did. no, no, <laughs> Who knows? It's the story, this oh, story course, that was remembered. All right, all that associated with that photograph. We've got another, uh, this is Port Simpson, actually. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a, uh, more of a coastal city, more, uh, not as far up the inland. Well, actually, yeah, you go around and you go north past Prince Rupert, and it's up there. It used to be called Port Simpson, now Port Simpson. And uh, the guy called George Rudge, and you'll see in this photograph, Mike, that there's a, there's a Hotel Northern there, and the Hudson's Bay store on the left-hand side, and the Hotel Northern on the right. And anyway, they were sitting down there white, one night having a few drinks, which Wiggs O'Neill was not, you know, he was inclined towards that a little bit. And um, one of the guys said up, uh, Charlie, somebody said uh, to George Rudge, who was the owner of the hotel, he says, George, he says, I wonder if they're ever going to find that safe from the old Mount Royal that went down, right? And the old Mount Royal went down in 1907. Captain Johnson was the captain. And uh, Rudge looks up from the bar and he says, I hope not. And they said, well, why? And he said, well, he said, the, the night it went down, he said, and there were five people drowned on that when it went down. He said, I was playing in a poker game the night before, actually, with Captain Johnson, he said, and a couple of other very sharp operators. And he said, Captain Johnson should have been cap called Captain Stoneface, because he never betrayed what he had in his hand, whether he had a, uh, a pair of deuces or, or, or a tight or a flush or whatever he had. And he said, he won $900 off me, and almost all that was in checks. So he went down and put it in the safe on board the uh, Mount Royal. Mm -hmm. And he said, but the Mount Royal, fortunately, he said, he said uh, went down on the canyon, and I hope they never discover the safe. <laughs> he didn't write a second <laughs> check out for oh, this. He says, your check is already in your safe. <laughs> That's right. That's never it. paid the debt twice. All right, good stories. We've got to take a break here, but we're going to be back and continue our look at some ghosts along the Skeena as Gold Trails continues. Don't go sort of enigmatic photographs that yeah. uh, they look, well, for example, this one, this looks like a Queen Anne replica mm -hmm. house, quite a mansion, oh. but what's the story behind this well, house? Well, it is a mansion. It was the biggest mansion in Port Simpson, no doubt about it, from the greatest chief in Port Simpson, uh, Dudaward, Chief Dudaward, and he looked in a book which il illustrated various houses just before the turn of the century, and he mm -hmm. said, I like that one, and of course, he picked out the most expensive one, and they built it to perfection. They really built it to perfection. I don't know where he got his money. I've searched the records, Mike. I can't find out. Well, that is a story in itself, isn't it? Yeah, very, very interesting. I mean, in, in past years, Chief said, uh, negotiated with Hudson's Bay Factors for gold in exchange for blankets. Do you think yeah. Mr. Dudouard went the other way? Uh, Chief Dudouard? Oh, you're referring to the gold in the shot at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He may have. Yeah? I don't know. 
but he had he was very wealthy. In fact, two steering wheeler captains married two of his daughters. That is the uh, interesting story. Yeah. Now, this is to my favorite. The favorite photograph of this show is this shot. I disagree, but let's take a look. At look it. at those. Look yeah, at those stern wheelers tied up along the, the river. Yeah, that's that's coming towards the end of the line, and that's on the screen. Of course, four stern wheelers in this photograph, and uh, it's starting to wind down the old stern wheeler era. And there's a reason for it, of course. Then there's the reason in this shot. Yeah. This is that great story of the Grand Trunk Pacific. Yeah. Supposed to be the opponent of the CPR. Sure. Tell me it again. Just well, <laughs> you know, what, what happened when the Grand Trunk Pacific came through, it spelled the finish of the, uh, of, of, of the stern wheelers. And, of course, Charles Hayes was the, was the genius behind the Grand, Grand Trunk Pacific. When he went down uh, on the uh, Titanic, on the Titanic in 1912, if I remember correctly, that was the end of the gr dream of the Grand Trunk Pacific and, of course, the end of Charles Hayes. And there it is under construction, sure. Grand yeah. Trunk Pacific at Skeena Crossing, 1912. Yeah. And that was that's right. And instead of waiting for the, the stern wheeler, now they waited for the train. And, and there, there's New Hazleton. Yeah. I guess that's one of the towns which it still exists. Yeah, it still does. And it's really quite a nice town. I'm kind of fond of it. But that's that, that, about 75 or 80 people in there. So, so the old, the old Skeena River, and, uh, you know, you can talk about the Hegelwith Bridge, which is, which is really, I think, quite amazing. We mentioned Look it very briefly. Look at this rickety piece of... <laughs> Built with hay wire, actually telegraph wire, Mike, from the uh, Collins Overland Telegraph Company. And uh, strung together, and who would walk across that on a cold winter night in the dark? I don't think so. But evidently, people handled it so carefully, there were very few accidents. What a fascinating story. So we have, on this Skeena River... Yeah. Uh, communities that blossom, flourish sure. with great commercial inpouring yeah. of money, Port Essington, yeah. and today maybe a bit of boardwalk and some abandoned shanties yeah. and nothing else. Some of them just grass grown. You can't tell where Kitsilis is. That's interesting. You know, and if you went back there, it would be that uh, the ghost that would be with you. Nothing I think more so. spectacular. It's a beautiful river. All right, on. Thank you, Bill. The story today Ghosts Along the Skeena River. With the help of some photographs of that time, I hope you enjoyed it. Join us again next time for more Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. We'll see you then.